Um, welcome to this How To Academy event with me, Matt Stadlin, I'm a presenter on LBC, and Professor Peter Singer of Princeton University, is a professor there of bioethics. He's been called many things, including the father of the animal liberation movement. We've got so much to talk about, not least given that it seems almost certain that this pandemic was caused by the relationship between human beings and wildlife between human beings and animals. We'll investigate all of that in, in great detail and news reaching us overnight from China as well of a, a new strain of pig flu that has the potential at least, although China doesn't seem to be particularly worried about it at the moment, the potential to become another pandemic. So we've got all of that to talk about. We'll also talk about morality and ethics in general. Peter, it's great to have you with us. A great honour for us to have you with us at the How To Academy. It's a virtual event, of course. We'd love to be on stage. We'd love to have coaxed you over here to, to the UK. Although it's quite a distance anyway, because you're currently based in, in Melbourne. Thanks for, for joining us. I wonder whether we might be able to, to start just briefly in synopsis with your reflections on how this pandemic began and what you think it can teach us about our relationship with the animal world? Well, it, it seems that the pandemic began from the wet market in Wuhan. Uh, a wet market, for those not familiar with the term, is a market at which uh, live animals of various species are kept and exhibited for sale, but uh, not so that people can take them home as pets, uh, when somebody buys, points to the animal and buys it, that animal is then killed and there are animals that people are consuming. So uh, in China, it's, it's believed that the virus may have been come from a pangolin, uh, which is a sort of scaly, antidote-like animal that uh, is a delicacy among Chinese. And uh, it may in turn have got it from bats. It's not, uh, we, we're not sure. But uh, these wet markets are obviously horrible places for animals, all kinds of species mixed together, crowded in cages, um, and then killed, of course, without any pre-stunning uh, to be sold to customers. So um, they're an, a nightmare for, for animals, obviously terrified and confined in these spaces that they're not used to, wild animals. They're also extremely unhygienic because the feces and the blood of the animals is all there in the open. Uh, and uh, so that's one way in which a pandemic can start. But I'm glad you mentioned the uh, pig flu, which is just very recently in the news, uh, because the other way that pandemics start is from factory farms. And in fact, we've had a swine flu pandemic before, the last official pandemic declared by the World Health Organization in 2009 was uh, swine flu. Um, and that actually killed about as many people, it was estimated may have killed about as many people as the coronavirus pandemic has killed so far, something just around half a million. That's the upper estimate. Um, but it wasn't as much publicized because those were mostly people in poor countries. And uh, so we weren't so worried about it. But, um, you know, yes, this is a, another well-established way in which pandemics occur from, from intensive farms. That you are well known as not being a religious man. You don't really bring religiosity to, to your understanding of ethics and, and morality. And I, I don't either, particularly. And I certainly wouldn't subscribe to the idea that, that a pandemic is somehow some sort of divine retribution. However, there is perhaps a moral tale in all this, isn't there? That if we muck around with the natural world, whether that's taking wild animals out of their natural habitats and, and using them for our own bodies to consume in whatever way we choose. Or indeed, as you say, if, if we muck around with factory farms, if we sort of distort nature in that way, then there can be very negative consequences that are not bound to any deity. Of course not. But it is a lesson. There's a lesson in there, isn't there? I suppose there is a lesson, yes, that these things have consequences. That's actually more, more a Buddhist point of view, perhaps, rather than a, a view of a, a deity. But um, uh, yeah, when we do things that are different, that we haven't been doing for, from uh, previously for a long time, we don't know what the effects will be. And we may well get unforeseen and very negative effects. And, and that's here, um, again, this sort of well, I suppose 
people had eaten wild animals before, but maybe on a much smaller scale, um, not concentrating them together, not putting them in a big city. And then of course that spreads around the world because of international travel. So that's something that is different. And then uh, factory farming is completely different I, un until say, I guess this maybe got started in the 1950s, but until then we'd never had you know, 10 or 20,000 pigs altogether in, in a building or a complex um, or 20,000 uh, chickens, for example, which is absolutely standard way of producing chickens now. So uh, we hadn't crowded them and that of course creates opportunities for viruses to move among them and to mutate quickly. And because they're crowded and stressed, their immune systems are compromised. So that also means they don't resist them that well. So yes, these, these are things that actually have been known about. People have written about the risk of pandemics from uh, these things before, and we didn't listen. And now we're paying a very high price for that. To put this into some sort of context, to put your approach to this in some sort of context, I want to take you back to when you became a vegetarian. As I understand it, you were studying at Balliol College, Oxford at the time, and you had a conversation with someone who decided not to go for the pasta because the sauce contained meat. And he was able to describe to you very articulately the ethical reasons for not eating animals. Would you just take us through those arguments, if you can remember them, and maybe update them with your current thinking? Yes, so uh, firstly, you, you know, this is hard for younger people to re recognize, to accept, but uh, here I was, 24 years old, a graduate student. This was the first vegetarian that I had met. Um, there just weren't very many vegetarians around. Maybe I'd met a Hindu who was a vegetarian, but you know, I, I wasn't going to relate to that. Um, but he was a Canadian philosophy student, Richard Keshin. And um, when I asked him why he had this problem with the meat in the spaghetti sauce, which I was then happily eating, um, he, he said something quite simple. And that is, I, I don't think that it's right to treat animals in the way that the animals that are on your plate were treated. Um, so this was not, was not a religious viewpoint. It was not an absolute pacifist viewpoint that I think all killing is wrong, which I probably also would not have really uh, identified with. Um, but it was a view that was more related to the quality of life of the animal, the very poor quality of life of the animal, effectively to suffering. And because I was already favorably inclined to, to be a, a utilitarian, that is to say that it's wrong to cause unnecessary suffering. It's wrong to um, maximize suffering. We should be doing just the reverse. So this is something that I clearly had to deal with. Now, I had been thinking of my utilitarianism as concerned with people, with, with my fellow humans. Uh, and I had not really thought very much about extending it to animals. I, I suppose I didn't like cruelty, you know, if I thought of it, I thought of cruelty, like if I saw a man beating a horse or a dog or something, I would think that was a bad thing. You shouldn't do that. But I hadn't associated cruelty with the way animals uh, were being reared uh, at that time, because I, I really was, was quite ignorant about that. Uh, so um, it was a combination of fitting in with a view that I generally held, except that I had to extend it to all animals um, and learning about the relevant facts uh, about factory farming, which uh, was, you know, still was already there in the, this is 1970. Um, uh, so that's what led me to think about the question, are we justified in saying, uh, well, all humans are equal and all humans have certain rights, human rights. Um, and so therefore it's wrong to treat humans in certain ways, but animals of course are not equal and of course can't have human rights. So it's okay to treat animals in those ways. That, that was what I had to start thinking about. And after doing so, I came to the conclusion that the boundaries of our species is not a good moral boundary. It's not in itself something that is morally relevant to whether a being has rights or is equal any more than, than for example, uh, boundaries of race would be right to say, well, only white people have human rights and others don't, or only men have human rights and others don't. So it was, it was that kind of argument that led me to think that what I was doing in eating meat was wrong. You compare that the rights of animals to the rights of human beings. And I wonder whether there is a line that you draw there. Your book in 1970, 
five, animal liberation. I mean, I mentioned in my introduction that you're seen by many as the father of the animal liberation movement. Perhaps you can sum that up for us, what the key message was, because this idea that animals have similar rights or the same rights as human beings is very controversial. I want to probe that a little bit more. Sure, but first let me say, or I already mentioned that I'm a utilitarian, so I don't start from rights. I don't start by intuiting what rights you have or what rights I have or what rights pigs or cows or dogs have. Um, I'm prepared to talk about rights, but to me, rights derive from something more fundamental. Um, and uh, so we need to start with that more fundamental thing. And the more fundamental thing I believe is is consciousness. That is the capacity to have experiences. I think of consciousness as meaning that there's something that it's like to be that being, right? So that um, if there's something that it's like to be you and there's something that it's like to be me, um, there's nothing. There's nothing that it's like to be my phone, for example. Um, it's not a conscious thing, clever as it might be in some sense. Um, but there is something that it's like to be uh, a cow or a pig or a dog or a chicken. Um, and so when that's the case, then uh, we, we have to ask the question, is there some reason why the pain of uh, a dog or a pig or a cow or a chicken matters less than the pain of uh, you or me or um, a, a newborn baby or, or some other being? Um, and I, you know, when thinking, I guess what I argue in animal liberation is, uh, no, there isn't that, uh, the principle that we should apply is one of equal consideration for similar interests. Now the similar interests of course is important. And this goes to your question about do humans have rights that animals don't? Well, one interest that we have and our children have is getting an education because of that an education we'll miss out on it a lot. We won't get on well in the world and so on. So yes, you can say humans have a right to an education. Obviously dogs and pigs and cows and chickens don't. Um, but that's because of their, their different nature. But, uh, and, and there's various other interests that we might have that they might not. But where we talk about similar interests, and again, pain is the obvious example of a similar interest, then I don't think the fact that this being is not a member of the species Homo sapien uh, has anything to do with how bad it is that it's in pain. I think what it has to do with is how bad is the pain? What's it experiencing? So where do we stop and start with that? Because as I said, it's a controversial, it's a, fa it's a fascinating argument, but how do we end up prioritizing our own needs over those of animals? Or, or rather, how should we deprioritize those needs? I'll just give you one example. Simply by walking out of our house or our flat, we will probably kill some form of animal life, an insect here, a bug there. Is that legitimate? Is that reasonable? Or does that count as unnecessary suffering on the part of the bug? So the first thing is, you know, I, I've been using as examples, um, birds and mammals, um, chickens and dogs and pigs. Um, I'd certainly be prepared to extend that to all vertebrates, um, to fish, for example. Uh, but when you get to bugs, um, we become much less certain as to whether there is consciousness. Um, uh, and I say less certain, I'm, I'm not saying there isn't, um, but I think it's, it's much harder to know. Uh, so why do we know that uh, vertebrates feel pain? Well, um, in part because they have quite similar nervous systems to us. Um, you know, common evolution there, uh, uh, a central nervous system going to a, a brain. Um, that's, that's the main reason. And then of course there is behavior, which is somewhat similar as well. When we get to uh, invertebrates, well, uh, maybe not all invertebrates, but certainly most invertebrates, um, the, well, let me, I should start again. With, I think with all invertebrates, we have a different kind of nervous system um, because the evolutionary gap between us and them goes back much further and we've evolved in different ways after the vertebrates sort of hived off. Um, so uh, we don't have as close an analogy with the way the nervous system works, but it's certainly still possible that there's consciousness and pain. And in fact, in some invertebrates, namely the cephalopods, the um, 
octopus and squid, uh, it seems very likely just from their complex behavior. It's hard to imagine their behavior taking place without consciousness. So consciousness has evolved at least once, I think, separately in invertebrates. Does it apply to the bugs that you're tre treading on as you walk out of the house, whatever they might be, ants, let's say? Uh, I honestly think we don't know. Um, I think it's quite possible that they're not conscious. Some of their behavior seems quite rigid and that might suggest that. But um, I would say, so because of that and because of that doubt and not knowing what their consciousness is like, I would say um, you don't have to stay in the, in the home. Um, you know, that's too serious a constraint of your interest to balance against the merely possible interests of the ants you might tread on. Mind you, if, if, you know, as you walk out, you notice some beetle crawling across the path, I think you should alter your step and try not to tread on that uh, beetle crawling across the path. So, so it, it depends what's at stake as to how respectful we should be of the interests of beings where we're not really sure whether they're our interests in the conscious sense. I understand, we, we lost your, your moving picture momentarily there, I think, but we can hear you loud and clear. I understand that we're, we, we are already having a philosophical conversation, but I wonder how you apply that, Professor Singer, to the, to the real world and to the, the practical realities of, of daily life and to the people you rub shoulders with, well, pre-pandemic rub shoulders with, as you walk up and down your hometown of, of Melbourne or when you're at Princeton. Do you in any way distinguish between someone who commits a murder and someone who eats a lamb chop for their afternoon dinner? Oh, absolutely I do. Um, and again, I think this is a matter of uh, understanding the very different interests in continuing to live. I think that somebody who commits a murder um, takes the life of somebody who is aware of themselves as living over time, planning their future, uh, they cuts off their plans. So for example, suppose you, you killed a student, you killed somebody who has gone to university in order to pursue a career, is working hard in order to do that. Um, and all of that is now completely nullified because you've killed that person, they can't do it. So it's, there's an interest in continuing to go on living. There are also relations with others. So other people know that somebody has been murdered, they become insecure. Uh, they change their behavior or they, they're anxious about going out at night, let's say if you, the murder took place at night. Um, and of course, the family and friends are shocked and in, in deep grief. Um, these things are different with non-human animals. In some cases, there may be a sense of loss and grief, I think, with social animals. Jane Goodall certainly observes this with chimpanzee mothers whose babies died. So I'm not saying that these things are exclusively human, but I am saying that some aspects of this are different. And just as with the example of our interest in education, I think our interest in continuing to live uh, and not being murdered, not being threatened by others, um, is a much stronger interest than that of an animal who you know, has an interest in not suffering and enjoying their life, but may not have the same uh, sense of uh, a biographical life, a life going on into the future. You've spent a career observing, studying, not, not just animals, but, but humans as well, and our behavior and our, the way we act morally or immorally. And I just wonder why you think it is that we are so capable, so many of us, of subordinating the interests and the suffering of animals to those of human beings, to those of ourselves. I mean, even within the animal kingdom and our attitudes towards it, we subordinate some animals to others. So in the West, the idea of eating dog is just anathema to us. But is there logically a reason why eating dog is worse than eating a cow or, or, or a sheep? Why are we capable of cooing over a baby lamb frolicking in the field, at the same time enjoying a, a roast lamb meal as we watch the sun go down and the lambs gambling? Yes, okay, there's a lot of good questions there. Um, so just to take one question that I can think of a concrete answer to, is there a logical reason why it's worse to eat a dog than a lamb or a pig or a other similar animal? I think the answer to that is no. Um, I don't think it's a matter of logic at all. 
I think it's a matter of the fact that uh, traditionally we have not eaten dogs. And on the, in contrast, we have had dogs as companions. So many people have lived with dogs. They've more or less been a member of their family. They know them well. They understand that they have wants and feelings and needs. Uh, and to them, this idea of, of uh, eating a dog is abhorrent. Uh, whereas in other cultures, perhaps people have not had dogs as companions and uh, have seen them as something to eat. And that feels different to them. Now, they may also treat the dogs very badly. I've certainly seen film of uh, video of dogs being uh, sold at the markets in uh, South Korea, for example. Um, and the treatment is horrific. It's, it's, it's worse than the treatment of pigs, generally speaking, I guess, in, in this country. Although when you think of the factory farming, that's maybe, maybe that's wrong. But, but certainly in terms of the way they're handled, um, they, they're handled very badly. So that might be relevant. But um, essentially, no, essentially, I think that if, we, if pigs were cute to live with and we lived with them and didn't eat them, we would feel the same about cultures that ate pigs as we now feel about cultures that eat dogs. Does um, proximity but, have something to do with this as well, Peter? Because if you were to watch an animal suffering, and this is, I presume, why I was once in a square in, in Vienna and you saw a, a mobile screen showing terrible animal cruelty, which was encouraging us not to eat meat. And I went and had a pizza, a mushroom pizza, rather than a Wiener schnitzel. I'd almost gone to Vienna so I could have a Wiener schnitzel and it put me right off it. But is proximity something to do with it? Sort of out of sight, out of mind. What, why are we as human beings capable, to use that word again, of, of empathy when something is before our eyes or we can hear the, the, the squeals of anguish? But when it's out of mind, the, the dogs in, in, in markets in China or South Korea or the factory farms in America, why are we able better to deal with it? How, how, do, how does that teach us? What does that teach us about our powers of empathy? Yes, let me just say the factory farms are not just in America. They're right there in the United Kingdom, of course. Um, they're, they're in all industrialized countries. Um, so I do think that we have somewhat limited uh, capacities for empathy. And I do think exactly as you said, when we see something, it's uh, present to us and we feel empathy for it. Um, but we limit that quite well. And if you say, why is that? Um, I suppose it's got an evolutionary explanation. Um, we, for most of our evolutionary history as early humans and even as uh, non-human primates before we became a separate species, we've lived in small social groups. Um, and within those social groups, we have developed um, certain moral practices, you could say, or certainly certain empathy and, and feelings for each other and uh, uh, observed each other and notice when somebody is in need and generally have an instinct to help people who are in, in need within that group. But, uh, and, th and that served, uh, gave us an evolutionary advantage in terms of the group flourishing and uh, uh, us flourishing as and doing well within that group. So uh, it's not surprising that we developed that, but because we were in these relatively small groups and we uh, had, you know, there went, well, there were other groups maybe living on the other side of the mountain range or in the other valley, um, but we didn't have much to do with them and we didn't develop empathy for them. And certainly in, in some countries and some cultures, so if, if you wandered across the mountain range into the next valley, um, you might be killed by the tribe just because you had no business being there. So um, I think that we had that kind of limited empathy and a part of that is, is still with us. Um, we've expanded our moral horizons, but we haven't always expanded the feelings that go with it. To what extent do you think our morality is shaped by the society or culture within which we reside? And I ask the question because when you became a, a vegetarian 40 years ago, I suspect it would have been much harder and braver thing to do because you were much more out of kilter with the rest of society than you would be today. Absolutely. In fact, the leading vegetarian restaurant in London at the time was a place called Cranks, which was kind of self-mockery, I guess, that, you know, all vegetarians are cranks, which was a general attitude that people had. Um, so, yes, it, it was harder. And I think, um, I think our morality is shaped by our culture, but it's shaped gradually and change takes place slowly. And 
although vegetarian and veganism for that matter, which was pretty much unknown in 1970, um, although they're much more widespread now and people understand them and more positive to them. So it's easier to make that change. Uh, for many people, it's still, uh, there's a powerful habit in favor of eating meat and they still feel that it would be difficult to make that break. Um, they get together with their family for meals and meals are festive occasions. Uh, and they would have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to eat that turkey for Thanksgiving. If you're an American, let's say, or the, chicken for Christmas or whatever the roast you might be having. So I think for a lot of people, that's, it's still not all that easy. Um, it's easier, but it's not so easy. It's becoming harder to eat meat, I think, and perhaps even consume dairy products than it once was, because more and more people are beginning to be vegetarians and vegans, certainly in, in this country, as I understand it. To, to what extent do you think shame plays a role? Uh, shame may play some role, but um, I'm, I, I hope that it's rather the positive factors that are leading people to make these changes and to think, you know, well, I don't want to contribute to animal suffering. I don't approve of factory farms. Um, and also, of course, I'd like to minimize my greenhouse gas emissions. So there are lots of good ethical reasons for why you would cut down on your animal products and uh, Perhaps eventually that's a path that leads you to eliminate them entirely. But as a philosophy, I'm, I'm sure you're interested in this idea that we can still live cheek by chow with people who live very, very different lives with different moral implications. So you might be married to a vegan and still hold on to your desire to eat meat and, and also continue to practice meat eating. How do you understand that? What, what does it say about human beings that we might intellectually know something we, we talk about climate change. We might intellectually get climate change, but emotionally we can't quite make that step. Yes, uh, I think there are a variety of different reasons. I, I already mentioned the sort of the, the habit of what you've eaten before. Um, there's some, for some people, there's a, a taste preference, I suppose. Some people say, I don't like a meal without meat. I, I actually thought that that would be the case with me when I became a vegetarian 45 years ago, but it didn't last very long. Once I discovered the wide range of cuisines where meat isn't central and where you could have a whole range of other things, um, I've enjoyed my meals as, as much, if not more than, than ever, I would say. But uh, some people find that difficult to imagine. Um, uh, but in general, I think what the, the phenomenon you're pointing to, which is, is not only about uh, what we eat, but about other things that we do as well, is that we're, we're somewhat selfish. Um, and we, you know, the, we're, none of us are, are saints. None of us are 100% ethical all the time, I think, or at least I don't know any people like that, and I don't claim to be like that. Um, but uh, we give differing weights, different importance to trying to act ethically and live according to our principles. And some people give it a lot of weight uh, and other people give it relatively little. And I think the people who say, you know, yes, I know climate change is bad, but um, you know, I just want to keep doing whatever I'm doing with whatever the emissions are that I'm causing. Um, you know, many of them would be in the camp that says, I'm, I'm not really thinking that much ethically. Of course, they can also say, you know, I'm just one individual. It doesn't make a difference what I do. Um, but, you know, obviously we all have to change. And in fact, our governments have to change as well. So um, that's not really a good reason for not trying to reduce your emissions. I wonder as well whether guilt plays a role. That if, if you've eaten animals all your life, and you're looking for personal salvation or looking to do the right thing, you think, well, I've done so much bad already, I might as well continue. I'm not subscribing to that view, but I suspect there's yeah. something, something in there philosophically. I want to broaden this conversation out to ethics more generally, but first of all, let's go back again to, to the animal liberation movement. In, in what sense do you subscribe to this idea that you were the father of the movement? And there were quite challenging elements of it, because in, and I'm not for a second suggesting you subscribed to, to this part of it, but there was, a, there was a lot of violence and a lot of threat to the point where people would have to be put under home security initiatives. Yes, uh, there were threats and there was some violence. I reject the idea that there was a lot of violence. There were some 
violent incidents, very regrettable in my view, you know, the wrong thing to do in general, but also actually quite counterproductive for the movement. But compared to other movements, say compared to the anti-abortion movement in the United States, where several doctors were, were murdered, uh, doctors who carried out abortions uh, uh, around the same time that the animal liberation movement was growing, um, there was nothing there was nothing like that um, in the animal movement. But it, it was regrettable and I certainly don't support it. To what extent do I accept the label that I was a father? Well, I think I, think I articulated the principles in animal liberation in a way that hadn't really been done before. Although certainly some of the ideas that I used were around already and had been around. There was an Englishman, a teacher at Eton, in fact, called Henry Salt, who wrote a book called Animals Rights in Relation to Social Progress published, I think, around 1903 or something like that. Um, it just didn't make any impact, thank. But, uh, but those ideas were around. They're not really new to me. In fact, Jeremy Bentham has this famous footnote um, about saying he's talking about in the time of the French Revolution, he's talking about how the French have discovered that the color of a man's skin is no reason for uh, abandoning him to the caprice of a tormentor, I think Bentham says, and says one day we may discover that whether they have a tail or fur or whatever is similarly no such reason why they shouldn't get rights, something of that sort. So, you know, those ideas have been around for a while, but I think uh, I articulated them uh, and related them to a lot of the facts about factory farming and the kinds of experiments that were being performed uh, in a way that that made an impact in 1975 and that did help to kick the movement off. I want to pick you up actually on experiments because that's an example, another example of where we prioritise our own interests. But I think most people wouldn't question the, the medical use of animals if, the, if it is likely, overwhelmingly likely to save lives. Where do you stand on that now? Well, I'm, I'm, because I'm a utilitarian, I'm, I'm not an absolutist on that. Um, and I know some of my friends in the animal movement um, you know, are, are sort of shocked when I say these things. But uh, it is conceivable, at least, that an, ex an experiment on animals can be justified because it has uh, much greater benefits, uh, either for humans or for animals, for that matter. It could be veterinary medical experiments that will benefit animals. Um, so I am prepared to... Um, make that trade-off, whereas some people will say, um, my friend Richard Ryder, for example, who's written about uh, animal experiments, says you can't justify inflicting pain on one being to benefit others. Um, so, you know, I think there is a fairly fundamental moral difference there. But I, I do think, and in Animal Liberation, I described lots of experiments, which are clearly not justified because they inflict uh, great suffering on animals and uh, they're not uh, urgently, you know, curing urgent, uh, urgently needed life-saving experiments to cure diseases. Therefore, all kinds of trivial things. Um, and uh, so I think that if you really looked at which experiments can be justified from a, a viewpoint that impartially weighs the pain and suffering of the animals against the benefits that might occur, you might still allow some experiments, but it would be a very small fraction of the number that we allow today. But if we extend this argument of utilitarianism, and you, you've self-described as such twice in our conversation so far this afternoon, well, where do you stop with that? Would it, be, would it be okay to use human beings for experiments if it were to the utilitarian good? Well, um, certainly, uh, and this is a very relevant question right now in the pandemic, um, certainly I, I think we would be, and I've, I've, I've published about this, we would be justified in using uh, human volunteers, and there are human volunteers who are saying, um, I'm prepared to have a vaccine um, injected into me, a, a promising candidate vaccine, and then to get deliberately infected with uh, the coronavirus to see whether it works so that we get the vaccine sooner. Um, you can go online or a website called One Day Sooner and you'll find, last time I looked, I think something like 30,000 volunteers who've signed up for that. Um, and I think, you know, yes, if these people are willing to do that, we should take them on. But there is this difference, of course, that humans can give this informed consent. And uh, we do regard that and I regard that as an essential requirement here. Whereas animals can't give informed consent. Um, now, some people might say, well, because they can't give informed consent, 
it's always wrong to experiment on them. Um, but I think that, there, as I said, I think there may be cases where it's not wrong, but it would be wrong to do that with humans because um, they, again, they, they have different interests. They are capable of understanding what's happening or not. If you, if you used humans for experiments without their consent, you would again cause fear and across the community that they might be seized and experimented on in that way. Um, I think you get a very different kind of situation because of the knowledge that humans have of what is happening to others like them, which um, the animals in laboratories don't have. How do you protect the rights of minorities in a utilitarian world? Well, I think you protect them um, with the idea that uh, we need to have some basic frameworks where everybody can feel secure and that they're not going to get picked on. And otherwise, um, you know, we, we pick on some minorities maybe and, and uh, victimize them. And then uh, we pick on others and uh, perhaps none of us really feel secure with that. And uh, we can look at the past and the records of uh, abuses against minorities, which clearly were not justified. Um, but the, the dominant power group, um, when it can do this, will do this. And so I think we need, this is a kind of a, a safety barrier that we need to erect to prevent us going in the directions of some of the atrocities we've seen in the past. So are you saying that political utilitarianism, implementing utilitarianism on a, on a political scale in the real world, is compatible with fully fledged democracy? I think it is. I must admit that uh, that gets tested with some um, election results that we've had in the last few years. Um, but uh, I think, you know, certainly the early utilitarians, Jeremy Bentham in particular, uh, argued that uh, on exactly utilitarian grounds for democracy, because of course in his time, there was a very narrow franchise of uh, wealthy people and uh, rotten boroughs controlled by a few landowners and so on. And Bentham's argument was, if you want governments to be concerned about the welfare of all, of everybody in England, then you need to have everybody in England voting for those governments, because otherwise they'll only be concerned about the people with votes who will return them to office. Um, so that's a straightforward democratic argument on a utilitarian basis. I want you to, to give us very brief explanations of some of the key phrases or words that, that have, as it were, marked your career. So objective moral values, where do you stand on that? Because as I understand it, you've rather shifted your position on those over time. I have, yes, that's true. Um, when I went to Oxford at the time I was talking about before in uh, 1969, um, I did not think there were objective human values. Um, I was influenced by philosophers like R.M. Hare, who was then the professor of moral philosophy at Oxford, uh, who didn't think that there were objective values or objective reasons for action. Uh, he thought that um, we have our own desires. Essentially, this is a tradition that goes back to David Hume in the 18th century, that uh, we have desires and reason starts from our desires. And reason shows us how to get what we desire, but it doesn't actually tell us what to desire. It doesn't tell us what's good or, or bad in an objective sense. <clears throat> and I accepted that for a number of years, though I became less and less comfortable with it because I was troubled about the fact that without that, in a way, argument can come to a stop. And somebody can just say, well, this is my attitude. And uh, on, on that view, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not wrong because there's no objective truth or rightness or wrongness about this. So I started being influenced by philosophers like uh, the late Derek Parfit, who was, I think, one of the, the greatest philosophers of the late 20th and early 21st century. He died just a few years ago, um, who uh, in a very big, uh, well, originally two volumes, now three volume book called On What Matters, um, argued for the idea that some things are objectively right or wrong. Uh, and I uh, went back to Henry Sidgwick, who was a late 19th century utilitarian uh, at Cambridge, uh, who also argued that and argued that there are some sort of self-evident moral axioms, he called them, uh, and argued that things like pleasure is self-evidently good. Well, maybe not self-evidently, but that we can see when we reflect that pleasure and 
conscious experiences of the kind that we want to have and continue are good and those that we don't want to have pain and suffering are bad uh and uh eventually i, I became convinced that that was right that the the reasons why i denied objectivism coming from that tradition from david hume were not actually convincing in the end so i i do now think that there that there is objective truth that uh for example it's just the world is a better place if there's less pain in it than um, other things being equal, of course, than uh, if there's more pain in it. It leads us loosely into, into this idea of whether it's ever acceptable to break the law. Now, in, in all societies, clearly we're expected to abide by the laws in non-democracies as much as democracies. If we just take democracies for, for a moment, though, do you think it is acceptable, civil disobedience? if you believe that the, the, the cause that you are fighting, and I don't mean necessarily using violence, but the cause that you are, are fighting is, is so important that it justifies, even in a democracy, saying no to the rule of law. Yes, I do think that. In fact, that's what I wrote my thesis on at Oxford. On, uh, it was in the time of the Vietnam War. And of course, there was a lot of civil disobedience. And uh, it was later published as a book called Democracy and Disobedience. So it was exactly about whether in a democracy, civil disobedience can be justified. And I, I argued that it can be um, because it's a kind of a remedy for some of the imperfections of democracy. One of the imperfections of democracy is that everybody gets a vote, um, uh, but some people, of course, care very passionately, very intensely about some issues, and they matter to them greatly. And for other people still get to vote, although, you know, that doesn't, it's not a big deal to them either way. So, Civil disobedience is a way in which those people who do care strongly and think that something is seriously wrong can make a case to the population as a whole. And they can do so through civil disobedience in a way that doesn't challenge the rule of law as such. Because civil disobedience, I think properly understood, is not only nonviolent, but you actually accept the penalty of the law. So let's say you break the laws against trespass. So you accept that. You get your day in court, you can make a statement about why you did this. Uh, and the fact that many people are doing it, I think, then makes pressure on, on people as a whole. Look, these people really care about this. Uh, and I think it can be a useful remedy, as it was with uh, Martin Luther King's uh, nonviolent civil disobedience movement in the as part of the civil rights movement. You say it doesn't challenge the rule of law because you accept the punishment, but of course you have no choice in but to accept punishment. Well, um, you do have a choice because some people uh, try and escape. And in fact, we get, we get people today who are engaged in protest actions who are not accepting the punishment. Um, they're wearing hoods or something so that they can't be seen. Uh, in some cases, for example, in the uh, riots as a result of the uh, horrendous death of George Floyd, and, and I think protests were totally justified, of course, in, in that situation. But um, I don't know that... Um, you know, uh, throwing a Molotov cocktail at a, in a building and then running away is um, the, the right way to protest in those circumstances. But some people were doing that. So that's not civil disobedience. I draw a, a clear line between those two. How do we as human beings, do you think, and how, how efficient are we? And we'll come to effective altruism in, in a bit. But how, how efficient are we as human beings in weighing up competing morals on our on our mental scale. So you, you mentioned the Black Lives Matter protests and said they're entirely justified. And of course, I, su I support the, the idea that we need, far, well, we need equality in our societies and we haven't got it, not by a long shot. But I remember that recently in the last couple of weeks, ca covering these protests on LBC, but just reading the news as well, that I, I was very anxious that in, in trying to promote equality, people were not going to harm themselves, harm their loved ones, and, and, and risk this pandemic becoming even more serious than it already is. How equipped are we as individuals to say, okay, I, I wanna fight for equality on this side, but I also, I want to do my bit in a pandemic to make sure that, that the virus is, is contained. How, how yeah, we're, we're not well equipped about that at all. How do we go about that as human beings? Yeah, to, to, yeah. How efficient are our scales? So, so the thing is, we, we, we watch this, this video of the Minneapolis police officer with his knee on George Floyd's neck when George Floyd is saying, I can't breathe over several minutes. Um, and we're, of course, outraged, and we should be outraged. And we 
say I want to go and protest and then somebody says but you know there's the pandemic and are you going to be able to keep uh, distance between people and so on and and that's more remote because we don't see you know let's say that in fact we unknown to us maybe we have no symptoms let's say we we do have the virus and by going to the protest we spread it to somebody else but we don't see that you know it's not as if the person falls down and starts groaning in agony as soon as while they're next to us because we just infected them with the virus so uh, again you know we, we're good at things that we see and video will count here but we're not good at things that we don't see and that applies to the pandemic and it applies to the greenhouse gas emissions again we don't see the harm that they're doing so yeah we're, we're, we're not good at calculating things that are not sort of uh, visceral to us that don't arouse our emotions in in some way does that make you pessimistic about our chances of tackling climate change given that it may well be too late by the time we realize that this is negatively severely impacting our own lives our own personal experiences mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm more pessimistic about our chance of solving climate change than I am about a number of other issues, um, like global poverty, for example, I think is relatively easier, not that we're there, but we've made progress. Uh, climate change is a particularly difficult problem for us because of this invisibility and also because the consequences of it are far away um, in time, or the worst consequences, of course, not all of them, some of them are happening right now, but the worst consequences are ahead in time, and we're also not very good at uh, giving full weight to the future. We tend to discount the future too much. So just enlighten us on the subject of effective altruism. You've written about it. What, what, what does it mean, and have you in any way changed your views on it? Well, I... Um, wrote about uh, altruism and the need to be more altruistic in the relation to people in extreme poverty. Uh, around the same time I became a vegetarian, I published an article called Famine, Affluence and Morality in 1972, uh, arguing that people in affluent countries ought to be doing much more than they uh, were and are for people in extreme poverty elsewhere in the world, people in great need. Uh, but what I've changed on is uh, the importance of effectiveness. Um, and that's something that has come out of the uh, movement that's probably now about 12 years old, I suppose. Um, I think of it, uh, I came, I was visiting Oxford again uh, about 2008 or 2009 and uh, a couple of young philosophers, Toby Ord and uh, Will McCaskill, who I met there, who were starting to talk about this and uh, talking about publicizing how you could have the biggest impact, not just, you know, that we should do more for others, but um, thinking about what we ought to do. And we ought to be, it's, that it's very important to find the ways that give us the best value for money. It, it's a kind of paradox that if we go out and we need to buy a new phone or a laptop or a car, we'll do a bit of research and say, you know, what is it that I need? What will give me the best value? for my money in, in what I need and getting what I need. But when we give to charities or causes, um, we typically do no research. Uh, we just, you know, something appeals to us and we say, oh yes, I'll give them something or some friend says this is a good cause. But, you know, we don't interrogate the friend as to how they know it's a good cause. So, uh, in fact, some of the organizations may do 10 times as much good with our money with this, uh, or even a hundred times as much good, uh, maybe several hundred times as much good in some examples as other charities. And, and yet we don't bother to find this out. So the effective altruism movement is putting research out there. Uh, it's online and websites like givewell.org and the life you can save.org, which is something that I helped set up um, to help you to find the most effective ways of, of using whatever resources you're prepared to put into helping others uh, to make sure that those resources are doing the most good that they can. Yes, of course, you wrote the book, as you say, that the most good that you can do. To what extent do you think we are preoccupied with doing good as human beings? Well, we're, we're, most of us are not preoccupied with it. Uh, that would be an exaggeration. Um, most, of us, most of us, I guess, have some interest in it. Um, and do it from time to time. Um, but now there are more people, and I think this is also part of the effective altruism movement. Um, there are more people for whom it's 
a very significant aim, perhaps the major aim in their life. Um, and uh, you know, it's interesting why this has emerged at this particular time. I think it has something to do with the internet. Um, I've had a lot of people who've contacted me or, or talked to me in person and said, you know, I grew up in this, and then they named some small town somewhere or other. And I always had this idea that really I ought to be trying to do good and to help other people. But I never met anybody else when I was growing up who thought that that was a sensible thing to do. They all thought it was, you know, a bit too way out there. But then they get online on the internet and they say, hey, there's this whole movement of people. Um, you know, you just put effective altruism into Google and, and you get a whole lot of websites, people talking about this, discussing it. So, so people then don't feel, uh, oh, I'm a bit weird. They, they think, ah, you know, we're really the vanguard of trying to make the world a better place. And uh, I want to be part of that. I want to bring in the Q&A in, in, in a moment or two, but we mentioned very briefly religion earlier on. How, how do ethics and morality exist in an atheist world or an agnostic world, where do they get their where do they get their legitimacy from? Well, I think they're actually flourishing, and I think it's really interesting that uh, you know a lot of people for centuries thought that uh, morality depends on on religion, and that if you don't tell people that uh, if they do good they'll go to heaven, and if they do bad they'll go to hell, then nobody's going to be ethical. Um, and yet we're finding um, you know, altruism and ethical ways of living flourishing in societies that are not particularly religious. Uh, you know, a lot of European countries uh, here in Australia, parts of the United States that are not particularly religious. Um, you know, it's not, it's not as if the more religious parts of the United States have a lot more ethical behavior. Um, uh, so, you know, I, th I think we see that uh, really ethics is, is independent of religion, um, independent of religion, both in terms of trying to find the right things to do. And I've already talked about that and my view on, on that, about um, doing the acts that have the best consequences uh, that will help to make a greater surplus of happiness over misery, um, which is, an, is a non-religious view, clearly. Uh, but also in terms of motivation, that uh, people find it fulfilling and rewarding to act ethically and to live in accordance with their values. And, and that seems to be at least as good a motivation as uh, the desire for reward and the fear of punishment. Um, I want to finish with a, a question about free speech and, and no platforming, because you, you've led a long and distinguished career. As I said in my introduction, you've been called many things and you, you, ha you have, of course, encountered controversy. And, and tell me if I'm wrong, correct me, I'm sure you will, but there was a point now decades ago, where you seem to advocate for active euthanasia of severely disabled infants. And as a result of that, I think particularly in Germany, I don't know whether you were no platformed in the sense that you might have been today, but you were the subject or object of lots of protests. This drew huge attention to you. Just on the specifics of the issue of euthanasia, where do you stand now, if I haven't got it wrong, that you stood in that position? You got one thing just slightly wrong. Yeah. What I advocate is that parents should be able to uh, euthanize their severely disabled infants if after consultation with doctors, they think that's the best thing for themselves, their family and the child. I don't advocate it. If, conversely, if parents think, no, although our child is very severely disabled, we want to love this child and bring this child up and give, them, give the child the best possible life, I support that too. And I think the state ought to give them uh, financial support so that that child can have the best possible life. So it's not that I'm, you know, in general advocating euthanasia for infants with disability. I'm advocating parents' choice. You could say that I'm extending the argument about uh, a woman's choice during pregnancy to end the life of her child for pretty much any reason, which is what a lot of progressive people think, including the fact that the child will be have a disability if born. Um, and I'm extending that to a short period after birth. So do, do you, you presumably you recognize that that will be very upsetting to a lot of people? Yes, um, I do recognize that. But um, there are also a lot of people who um, think that that's important. You know, I, I had, I've had over the years, many letters from people who tell me that they brought up their disabled child, and it's been a wonderful experience, and the child has a good life. But I've also had many letters from people who've said, uh, 
The doctors didn't consult me when my child was born severely disabled. They performed operations. They told me they were saving the child's life. Then they gave me the child, or gave me and my wife the child, and uh, handed it back to us. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been terrible for the child. It's been terrible for my family. Um, and uh, I wish the child had died in the intensive care unit. So uh, it goes both ways. It leads us then to this question of no platforming. How far should we extend free speech? I'm a strong advocate of free speech. I think uh, John Stuart Mill was right to say that we should have the fullest possible freedom of expression of ideas. Um, and that if we don't, even if we're quite sure that what we uh, think is right, um, but if we prevent people criticizing it, it becomes a kind of a dead dogma. Um, it's no longer a living truth. So I think even when we're right and the opponents are wrong, we should allow them to express their views. And the best way of uh, showing that they're wrong is not to silence them or no platform them, but to refute them, to show why they're wrong. And if we are no platforming them, I think that is often a sign of our lack of confidence that we can refute them. Do you draw the line anywhere? Yes, I draw the line at, at racial uh, or uh, ethnic vilification. So I do draw a distinction between uh, vilification and uh, argument. Uh, so I think, you know, vilification is something that appeals to emotions, um, that uses strong, colorful language to try to paint some particular group of people in uh, very negative ways, perhaps even to incite people to take uh, violent action against them to discriminate against them in certain ways. Um, but argument about uh, how we should best deal with certain situations, which you know, in some cases might be quite contrary to my views, but if somebody is attempting to put forward uh, evidence and arguments about what's the right thing to do, uh, I don't think that should be prohibited. It's fascinating listening to you. I want to bring in some questions from the audience. Sophia asks, would you give any criteria for consciousness? For example, one must move, one must be able to jump, etc. Well, certainly not to be able to jump. You might be uh, completely paralyzed um, and still uh, be able to show that you're conscious. Perhaps even you can talk, or uh, even if you can't talk, maybe you can blink your eyes for, for yes and no. So obviously we have conscious beings who can't move um, more than an eye blink. So um, it's, I, I think the criteria are varied. I don't think there's one set of criteria that apply in all cases. Um, but uh, in general, I, I mean, the, the, the concept is that there is something going on there. If you like, there are mental uh, things going on and there has to be some way, I suppose, of, of the being showing that. Um, and that might be by movement, by purposeful movement. Uh, you know, I mentioned the octopus before as a conscious invertebrate. So uh, octopuses are very good at escaping from their uh, enclosures. Um, and that's one way maybe of suggesting that they don't like where they are. Um, but uh, there are others who can't move, but uh, who can show us that they're thinking or that they're conscious in some other ways. Um, might be uh, uh, reactions to pain. You know, you sometimes you know some, somebody's conscious by um, pinching them and they react in a certain way. Uh, there's a lot of different beings in different cases. So well, you can't Peter goes further. Peter, Peter asked, doesn't all nature have rights without consciousness? So as it supports human and animal life, I'm thinking about ecological and, and, and climate crises. So I'm going to say no to that. Um, I think that consciousness is the prerequisite for having rights and for having intrinsic value. Certainly um, non-conscious things, plants obviously are absolutely essential for our survival um, and they're very important. And um, I think also I'm an advocate for protecting old growth forests as an uh, amazing heritage from earlier eras and uh, protecting biodiversity. But uh, to me, they're not entities that have rights in themselves. Uh, they're not beings with kind of intrinsic moral value. They're there because we or non-human animals depend on them or appreciate them in certain ways and their value is therefore instrumental rather than intrinsic. Christina has an interesting question. She says, wonderful to hear you, Peter. You mentioned the issue of Woodrow Wilson with respect to Princeton in your book, Ethics in the Real World. 
Previously, Princeton removed the picture of Wilson, she says. Now they've removed the name. Do you think seemingly small steps like this are a core part of the healing process? So this cuts right to the part of the question of, of statues that we're all engaging with. Yes. Um, so I, I think Princeton has made the, the right call here. Um, Wilson clearly was a racist and, and not just in like George Washington or uh, a racist as everybody pretty much was in his time. Wilson, when he was president of the United States, reinstated segregation in the federal public service, which had not been there for the past 40 years, I think, after the Civil War. Um, so, you know, for a, particularly for an educational institution that were, favors diversity, of course, and wants to have students of all different uh, backgrounds, um, it's pretty insulting to um, be a member of a college that is named after somebody who would have kicked you out of the federal public service. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that Princeton did the right thing. It, you might say it should have done it four years ago, and it took this um, more recent upsurge of concern about the systemic racism in the United States to get us to get the university to do it. But I, I think it's the right thing. Again, it raises a, a follow up question, though, doesn't it? Where do you draw the line? Take Winston Churchill, just right. as an obvious example. Yes. Um, so I think. I think there are strong reasons for suggesting that Winston Churchill statue should stay there, although he clearly was a racist and he clearly uh, said things that are quite, you know, we would want to violently strongly reject today um, and did things in the case of the, the Bengal famine too, that uh, were quite terrible and that a huge blot on his record. But, uh, you know, he did stand uh, against Hitler and Nazism and it's, hard to say where Europe would be today if it were not for Churchill uh, taking that stand and rallying England to fight on against the Nazis. Um, so I think there are reasons why there should still be a statue of Churchill. I want to end that conversation by coming back to animals and animal rights in, in just a moment. But while, while we've got you here, we've been talking so much about consciousness as part of that conversation as well. What about free will? Where do you, how do you understand free will? Do we have it? So I think uh, it's a very confusing question. And, the, the, um, you know, there's an article in the in literature called uh, The Kind of Free Will Worth Having. Uh, so, so the question is, what is it that we want to have? Do we want to have this idea that our actions are not caused by anything? That, um, you know, they're somehow com completely coming independently of the states of our brain or, or the f our background and the factors that have led us to be right here where we are now? I don't think we need free will in that sense. I think what we need is to recognize that we are beings capable of making choices and that there's a sense in which we are responsible for those choices. Even if in some sense, those choices come from this background and you might want to say are determined. Nevertheless, one of the influences on us is whether we are doing the right thing or the wrong thing, whether we'll get praised or blamed for what we do. So I think that ethics and moral judgment play a role here. And all we need is the idea that we are the kinds of beings capable of being influenced by those moral judgments and that praise and blame. So let's come back with three quick fire questions on, on animals. Morrissey says, do you think having meat eating pets like cats and dogs is moral? It's a clever question. Yes, it is. Um, so I think we should try to avoid meat eating pets if we can and we could uh, with dogs in particular they don't have to eat meat with cats it's certainly more difficult um, but uh, I'd like to encourage people to to move to other companion animals that uh, don't require us to participate in in the meat industry if we possibly can. Cat says are you yourself a vegan do you think the same arguments for vegetarianism apply equally to veganism? I'm not a strict vegan. I call myself a flexible vegan. I will occasionally eat things that are not completely vegan, but I particularly try to avoid uh, dairy products because I think the, the separation of the, the calf from the cow, and a lot of people don't know that to get milk, uh, dairy cows are made pregnant every year and then their calf is taken away from them. And as cows and uh, mammals, that's a strong bond between mother and child and it clearly causes suffering to both. So I try to avoid uh, uh, dairy products fairly strictly, but I will eat free range eggs, for example, if they come from places that I know where the hens are, 
out on pasture and living well. Um, I think that's not such a bad thing. Um, and uh, I um, would eat uh, lab-grown meat, cultured meat, if that comes on the market, uh, even though that would be meat. Um, but because no animal would have suffered and greenhouse gases would have been very low, uh, I wouldn't see a problem with eating that. Olivia asks, in your opinion, what is the most effective way of changing the mind of a meat eater without coming across as sanctimonious and hence creating a defensive bellicose reaction? Yes, uh, try to be positive about um, the enjoyment of uh, exploring uh, vegetarian and vegan cooking, different cultures, different cuisines, um, and the fact that it makes you feel good to know that you're not part of the factory farming industrial complex, uh, you're minimizing your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I agree, you, you can't be too preachy. And you know, one answer is uh, invite your friend for a delicious uh, vegan meal. And uh, that can often be effective. Should we finish with a final question from Sven, who says, do you support the notion of human beings having responsibilities as opposed to rights? Yes, I, I do. I mean, it's, it's not that I'm against talking about rights as I, as I have done in the context of something that is derived from more basic fundamental uh, ethical views. But um, I think thinking of our responsibilities to leave the world uh, a better place and the best place that we can is a good way of thinking about, about ethics. It's been great to, to have you with the How To Academy, Professor. All the way from Melbourne, it's amazing what Zoom can do. We've fitted in a huge amount, I think, in just over an hour. And Ruth says, thank you so much for organising this to the How To Academy. Peter, you're a very inspiring philosopher, and I love your work. Well, it was fascinating hearing you, Peter. And Good. thank you to everybody who, who joined from wherever you are, whether you're like Peter in Australia or America or China, wherever you're managing to get this feed from. It's great to have your company during the pandemic. We've got so many more exciting events ahead over the summer. So please do go to the How To Academy website, subscribe, and you can join us for that. I'll be speaking to John Humphreys, the, the former Today program interviewer, described as a, a bulldog interviewer. He's one of the most famous journalists of his generation. I'm sure that will be riveting in just a couple of hours time. So join us for that at three o'clock. But Professor Peter Singer, thank you so much. You've been described as one of the most distinguished, if not the most distinguished philosopher in the world today. We're honoured to have you with us. Thank you very much to you and thank you to everybody. Thank you, thank you Matthew. And uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. It's been good to talk to you. Bye.